on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. We have been creating incredible nourishing diets and improving on those diets for three and a half million years. We end up having these caricature ideas about our caveman past that are so flawed. Turns out most of these people are much happier and very well nourished. So many of these foods that are so super high in oxalates are being touted as superfoods. You almost get better results on a standard American diet than you do on these extreme health diets. Spinach isn't that bad, but we have taken the seasons out of the restaurants, made them available year round, and there are not only people eating them every day. There are people eating spinach twice a day. It's in the smoothie in the morning and it's in their lunch in the afternoon as a salad. I'm hesitant to jump on board with the number of things that blow through the dietary fad world. That said, I am aware of plants like Jack in the Pulpit or rhubarb that can very seriously harm you because of their oxalates. I do believe that the most nourishing, ethical, and sustainable diet possible for our species has still yet to be invented. It's damn close to something that's been in the past. Episode 148 of the Wild Fed Podcast, The Fad-Free Diet, Oxalates, Superfood, and Common Sense with Dr. Bill Schindler is brought to you by Sir Thrival. If you're looking to increase testosterone levels without turning to pharmaceutical testosterone replacement therapy, take a look at Sir Thrival's Pine Pollen. Pine pollen is a rich source of naturally occurring testosterone and a suite of other androgenic hormones that can be used to gently boost your T levels. Right now until the end of August, the coupon code RESTORE20 gets you 20% off all pine pollen products at SirThrival.com. My favorite is Sir Thrival's Pine Pollen Pure Potency. It's an herbal elixir I formulated with stinging nettle root to keep your body's free testosterone levels up while the pine pollen gently boosts them. It's got Siberian ginseng for hormone upregulation and maple syrup, vanilla bean, and orange peel to give it an incredible orange creamsicle flavor. Stop by SirThrival.com to check out the entire Pine Pollen lineup, including Pine Pollen Powder, Pine Pollen Tincture, and of course, Pine Pollen Pure Potency, Sir Thrival's flagship Pine Pollen product. These are formulas I use and stand by, and so do thousands of other men who've used them too. For the rest of August, use the coupon code RESTORE20 for 20% off all Pine Pollen products at SirThrival.com. These days, it's smart to have a side hustle. And as a wild food enthusiast in a rapidly expanding food-centric space, you're well-positioned to start your own small business. You've been hearing me talk about forage.market for some time now and for good reason. It's like Etsy for wild and specialty foods. Whether you're buying or selling, forage.market is the place that foragers like you are linking up with chefs, restaurants, and other foodies who are looking for your raw ingredients or value-added products. Join for free, list your products for free and be seen by millions of potential customers. Let's face it, getting noticed is hard, but forage.market makes it easy since it's the place your potential buyers are already shopping. With powerful shipping options, including local pickup and delivery, secure payment processing, and the ability to take pre-orders, forage.market makes selling and getting paid a breeze. Go over to forage.market slash wildfed to get started. There you'll find a coupon for 10 bucks off your first order of any of the incredible products you find there from other sellers. Learn more about their incredible vision and conservation ethic by listening to episode 122 of the Wild Fed podcast, forage.market the global marketplace for wild and specialty foods. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. We're back today with internationally known archaeologist, primitive technologist, and chef Bill Schindler. Bill's been on the show once before to discuss his book, Eat Like a Human, and he's back today to talk about human diet through the lens of his professional focus of ancestral human foods, food acquisition methods, and traditional processing techniques we once used to make our food more edible and nutritious. After our recent episode with Sally Norton, which was episode 142, Our Oxalates Destroying Your Health, where we discuss oxalic acid and other oxalates in our food supply, I wanted to get another opinion. I didn't tell Bill beforehand that I wanted to discuss this as I wanted his honest and unbiased take on the subject, but as it turns out, he's been keenly interested in this topic for some time and has been actively cutting oxalates out of his own diet with some pretty profound results. So while Bill and I discuss fad diets in general today, I really wanted to take our time exploring the issue of dietary oxalates since if they are as deleterious to our health as some allege, the ramifications are significant and they affect most of us. 
So this is a continuation of a conversation we began with Sally Norton, and it's something I'd like to continue exploring over time, at least until I feel like I've gotten a pretty good handle on it. For now, I remain undecided. Not a total skeptic, but I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid either. That said, I've been experimenting with my own diet a bit by gently and consistently removing some of the highest oxalate foods I've been eating, which you'll also hear me discuss here today. I'm not going all in since I still have some doubts and because I've grown progressively more allergic to dietary restrictions as I've matured, but I've noticed some anecdotal improvements in my own subjective experience. So for now, I'll keep pursuing it. In closing, I got interested in wild foods and in particular hunting, fishing, and foraging because I'm interested in human diet and nutrition. Sometimes in the world of wild foods, we get more focused on what we can eat rather than what we should eat. And I don't mean that ideologically, but rather nutritionally. So from time to time, I think conversations like this one are helpful because they remind me of why and how I got here, wanting to be my best and healthiest self. And I want that for you too. So I hope this interview helps you in that pursuit. Bill Schindler, welcome back to the show. It is a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, man. Thanks for those t-shirts you sent me, dude. They turn heads. Uh, I've got two shirts from you. I think uh, one says hunt, gather, repeat. And the other one says, uh, is it eat like a human on that one? Eat like a human. That's right. That's our yeah. motto. And uh, I love your logo, which is like that stone ads crossed with the chef's knife. Anyway, people always, you know, people always want to know about the shirt. So I uh, appreciate those. They're fantastic. My pleasure. Glad you were. Thank you. Yeah, man. What you been up to lately? Not much. Doing a lot of work here. The The restaurant's taken off, the Modern Stone Age Kitchen, and we just renovated the Eastern Shore Food Lab, so our teaching kitchen is up and ready, and we launched classes again on Saturday, so uh, we're, we're super excited to get kick, uh, kicking that up again. So you guys actually seat people like a restaurant? It's not just, um, you're not just pre- doing prepared foods, but people actually dine in there? Yeah, you know, it's really funny because my wife and I met in a restaurant. We were working at a restaurant called the Alchemist and Barrister in Princeton, New Jersey. We both started literally the same day. I was a new waitress, or she was a new waitress, I was a new bartender. And we would get so upset because we'd work late Friday nights and all weekends and everybody coming in and enjoying themselves. And we said, we're never going to you know, do this restaurant life later in life. Um, and so when we opened this place, <laughs> we kept saying to everybody, this is what we're doing, but we're not a restaurant, but we're not a restaurant. But the reality is, you know, our, our, our mission is to literally nourish the community and we do a lot of prepared foods, but people want to come and experience and, and eat in. So we're doing more and more nights that are, that are, that are seated. So we have a really nice patio outside. Uh, people are coming and, and, and it's beautiful weather right now. Um, and we have some limited seating inside. The problem is everything we do is 100% from scratch in here. Um, there's no two ingredients put together outside of these walls. So we have a lot of production space. It's taken up a lot of the seating. So we're, we're, we're trying to figure it all out. But, yeah, people come down and, and, and they sit inside and outside. That's awesome, man. I want to give you a second to just tell people a little bit, um, maybe a quick background and, and what your primary interests are today. Um, and then I actually want to talk to you about uh, oxalates because I had seen a product you guys just released and I recently had Sally Norton on the show and um, I'm a bit of a whirlwind on this one. Um, I kind of keep going back and forth. Anyway, I want to come back to it. But first, um, let people know who, if this is the first time hearing you, just a, a little bit about you know what your primary focus is and stuff. Sure. So uh, uh, by training, I'm a prehistoric archaeologist and anthropologist. So I have a PhD from Temple University in, um, in archaeology and anthropology. And my, my academic focus has always been that. It's always been ancestral uh, technologies and, and, you know, and, and evolution and those sorts of things. And about 20 years ago, I really realized the link between um, archaeology, anthropology, and uh, nourishing myself and my family, and now our community in, in, in the best way possible. I grew up hunting and fishing and trapping. Um, you know, my father had me out every weekend, and it was, it, it's been such a major, major part of my life that, uh, you know, that whole, you know, bringing all of those things together, connection with connection with the environment, connection with our past, connection with our food has literally transformed my life and my family's life. And that's, and that's exactly what we've done. So uh, I was a professor for uh, at Monmouth University for a long time. And then uh, most recently at Washington College here in Chestertown, Maryland for 15 years. And then uh, now my wife and I have left our, left our positions. She was a, um, the, um, head of special ed for a nearby county. And we opened up 
two entities. One is the Modern Stone Age Kitchen, um, and the other is the Eastern Shore Food Lab. The Eastern Shore Food Lab is our nonprofit focused on research and, and teaching and outreach. And the entire and what we want to do is educate, inspire, and empower people to to nourish themselves and their families and, and do so in a way that they can live their best life. I love it, man. I feel like a real kinship with what you do and what your focus is. And um, I just want to say that I think it's almost obscene that there are so many dietary approaches that are so divorced from the anthropology and archaeology. It just does not make sense to me. I just, I can't picture like putting an animal in a zoo and just saying, you know what, forget how the ones in the wild eat. Let's just let's just come up with some diet ideas. <laughs> it just that <laughs> seems like such a dangerous way to approach it. And people are just pulling diets out of a hat these days. And I think, you know, something you and I both understand pretty well is that in our, our audience does too, the foods that they're rearranging in these diets, most of them, if you don't know where those foods come from, so if you don't know the progenitor species or a little bit about them, or do they have historical uses? I mean, you're just playing with all these new tools, which is interesting and fun, but like if it's not grounded in the past. So if I was just going to start whipping together some, I think this is what a chimpanzee would eat. Um, I, I shouldn't be surprised if we get poor el- health outcomes, but people act surprised eating these diets that just have no resemblance to the last, you know, 3 million years of hominid evolution. 100%. And I know we talked about this in depth last time, but just for the, the, the um, everybody listening to, to some of this for the first time, the, the reality is we have been creating incredible nourishing diets and improving on those diets for three and a half million years worth of time. And even though our dietary change didn't push our evolutionary change, it is exactly what supported our body growth and our brain growth and really our population growth. And without, you know, the triggers for what caused our brains or to, 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 uh, want to grow larger and our bodies want to grow larger is not fully understood. We have some ideas, but even if those triggers were in place, if we didn't have the nutritional um, backing to support that massive uh, growth, we wouldn't be here today having this conversation. We'd still be up in trees swinging around. So the, you know, you're absolutely right. The idea that we can try to, un, you know, try to create this new novel diet that's going to, you know, save all, you know, solve all of our problems and our, and our modern Western diseases and all this with something new is insane. It's understand. We need to start. The foundation needs to be understanding the diets that literally built us and nourished us as a species. And then true. I, I do believe that the perfect human diet, that the most nourishing, ethical, and sustainable diet possible for our species has still yet to be invented. It's damn close to something that's been in the past. I mean, it, 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 that, that should be the model. And we shouldn't throw all technological innovation out because it was, after all, it's a technological innovation millions of years ago and hundreds of thousands of years ago that improved upon those diets to allow our body and brain growth. Um, but we are doing it. We're, we're just sort of like pulling things out of a hat and following down these paths that uh, we have we have no direction. I truly believe, and it sounds like we both do, that you start the foundation with a firm understanding of our evolutionary past, our dietary past, and then from there we should start to improve. But that eat like a human thing. It's 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 not just a play on words. It's it's real. These foods are the foods that allow us to actually live the lives we're meant to live. It needs to start there. I'm just getting to this age where um, I see people, younger people make, I see their commentary and I think, oh, they don't know what happened like 10 years before they were born because they didn't see it. So they're (laughs) acting out of ignorance about the past. And I'm like, oh, that's what I was doing, you know, in my teens and my 20s and my 30s, because I just didn't have a sense of where we had been. And, you know, now that I see that um, society's kind of cyclical from golden ages to declines, to collapses, to rising up to mm-hmm. golden ages, you know, and it keeps doing that. So when you don't know where you are in that cycle, <laughs> things can be very confusing. And so, yeah, I just, I noticed that it's easy to um, imagine that things have been more static or the trend line has been more stable and not realizing, you know, what's happened in the past. So I think that's some of what goes on there is people just mm-hmm. don't really know what happened before. But another thing that's weird about our era is the increase in technology so fast. So, you know, if you think about something like um, a basic, you know, f- a napped flint, you know, knife, 
you know, how mm -hmm. long did that technology stay relatively stable before there was some tremendous change? I mean, these, you know, paleolithic industries lasted very long periods of time, whereas today we move through technology so rapidly. You know, in, in our lifetime, we've watched, you know, the development of the mobile phone and the development of the, essentially of the computer and um, of the internet and things like that. Like we, we develop and move past and discard tools in a matter of years sometimes. So this is kind of new because we're at like the top of that hockey stick. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And like in the past, yeah. it'd be like, hey, man, we've been and the benefit of the past being what I mean is that you would know something was like safe to eat or you would know a tool worked well because it'd be like, well, we've had a million and a half years of it. So I feel pretty confident in this tool. Whereas we have things now that'll be like, no one's ever eaten this before. We're starting right now. And it's like, oh, geez, there's no there's nothing to look at, you know. <laughs> so uh, I don't you know, it's not to say that there some of those things can't be great and might not last a long time, but it's just a weird moment where we have all this new stuff to play with. And, and that's so relevant because one of the, you mentioned earlier that there's so many of these new diets are just getting pulled out of a hat and people are trying them. And you know what? And, and people are finding success, some success with so many of them. And the problem is, I think we get fooled into thinking that that success means that that diet is right. But the reality is all that that's really saying is that our modern diets that the majority of us are eating are so incredibly poor that any change shows some positive results. And, and then we get fooled into thinking, oh, this is the best diet for, you know, the best diet. Brian Sanders um, posted the other day, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, and I forget the exact wording, but it was something like, just remember the diet that healed you might not be the best diet for the rest of your life. And yeah, that's it. Exactly. Really that's relevant. so well yeah. said. Yeah. Or like, you know, I got to say, I mean, that you could be starving to death and then somewhere along that, um, journey, you're going to have great abs. <laughs> so, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, and you absolutely. could be like, look at how good it's working. I mean, just look at the definition. It's like, yeah. And then three weeks later, you, you can't get off the bed because you're too emaciated. So, I mean, you might have some temporary aesthetic results too. It doesn't mean that this thing is good for your, let's say your central nervous system and it's myelination yep. for long-term or something like that. Like you might actually be drawing off the bank account of stored fats in your brain. And this wouldn't be a yep, good thing. Absolutely. So, yeah. I, well, I think we talked about Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, yeah, please. No, I, we might have mentioned this last time, um, but I think it's really, really relevant. And I'd love to just bring it up very quickly because I think this is the way um, people should be thinking about their diets and how their bodies respond to their diets and, and really how, how they should be living. So um, before I did the show for National Geographic, um, my students were asking me, they wanted me to go in naked and afraid. And I really didn't want to go and naked and afraid for a million reasons. And, but I didn't want to tell the students that I, I wanted to blame it on somebody else. So I couldn't, that I didn't do it. So anyhow, I, uh, I went to my wife one night and I said, I'm going to tell my wife, this is right when naked and afraid first came out, but she'd seen it. And I went to her and I said, Hey, you know, um, students, what do you think about me being on naked and afraid? And I knew she would shut it down immediately. And she turned to me and she thought about it for a minute. She said, I think it'd be all right. And I said, what, what are you talking about? You've seen this. It's like two naked people and this guy and a girl in the woods in 28 days or whatever it is. And she's like, yeah, I've seen the show and you have too. Like, even if somebody's thinking about something amorous or sexual for a day, you know, when they start starving and getting covered by poison ivy and eaten up by bugs and sunburn and all this, the last thing on their mind is to have sex or to do anything like this. She goes, that might be the safest place in the world for you. <laughs> I said, you know what? You're absolutely <laughs> right. But in regards to this conversation and thinking about that, it really was a light bulb moment for me because at that time, another you know big discussion and people still have it today is, you know, they would say to somebody like me with uh, the way that I talk about the past, say, Hey, you're romanticizing the past. It wasn't this, you know, amazing all the time. And they weren't, all, and, you're right. But if you really think about it and go back to that conversation with my wife, we are talking about um, our ancestors who are not only procreating successfully, right, but they are doing such an amazing job that their bodies and their brains are growing exponentially over millions of years. So I know a lot of people look into the past and have this idea of survival. Oh, they were surviving. No, they were crushing it. They were doing so good. They were getting such incredible nutrition from their environments that not only were they having a massive amount of sex, but they were having, they were um, 
the, the <laughs> women where we're, we're having, you know, incredibly bringing babies to full term. Those babies were doing great. The, you know, there, there, it was, you know, certainly not a this amazing. There were people starving. There were populations dying out for sure. But at a species level, they were not surviving. They in, in, And really, I would even suggest that they weren't even just subsisting. They were doing incredibly well. So, you know, those diets, those diets that actually did that for our ancestors and, and, and actually for us, some, if you're consuming a diet similar to that, you should, and I know I mentioned this last time, I'm convinced every time you get up from the table, you should feel satiated. You should feel nourished. You should feel content. I mean, th- this food is supposed to nourish us. You can lose weight and feel satiated at the same time. So if you're eating a diet and maybe like you said, you, you know, you start to see your six pack and you're happy, but you're exhausted all the time and your sleep is terrible and you can't concentrate, then something is wrong. There's so many factors today <laughs> too, that are <laughs> leading to, you know, this, uh, depression, sadness, obviously this insane suicide epidemic we're in right now. Keep losing sure. friends, you know? I mean, this is like a tough moment in history. And it's so funny how quick people are to be like, well, the past was terrible. And it's like, well, do you know that? Um, but also, uh, I think one of, the, one of the things is when we start thinking about living in nature, we start thinking of survival, we tend to draw upon the literature, lore, and television <laughs> you know, content we've seen, movie content we've seen. Mm -hmm. And I think with like, um, you know, I think probably the best of them is uh, currently of the TV genres alone, which I mean, what a fantastically interesting thing to watch, but it's like, Hey, that's not natural. (laughs) Being alone is a punishment. So, you know, for some reason it's not interesting to us to watch 35 people do it together. (laughs) You know what I mean? Because that would be yeah. a much more realistic show, right? 35 people, a division of labor, real camps, that kind of support. And then also, it's not this thing like you show up and you got to figure out how to make everything. You're born into a culture where everything's already made and you learn mm-hmm. how to make things to sustain that. Um, you're born into a culture where everybody already knows what to eat, when to eat it, what the foods are, how to process them, how to you know, get to the different locations where those things are. So, but anyway, yeah, like you said it exactly naked and afraid, like as if that's our story, because that's not our story. That hasn't been our story for, I mean, how long have we had domesticated fire? I mean, being afraid is not actually our story, not for a very, very long, when, when being afraid was our story, we were, you know, and I'm talking about being afraid of nature. Um, we weren't, Homo sapiens. <laughs> we Not might even have been close. Like, <laughs> Five millions of years. Like, yeah. So yeah, we've been pretty confident about this stuff for a while. It doesn't mean there wasn't predation. Of course, there's been tremendous intertribal conflict and war, and um, you know that's been a huge story of, of ours for a long time. Even even if it wasn't at the kind of, in the kind of wars we think of today, but certainly there's intertribal conflict, and humans have been capable of a lot of really like atrocious stuff. But but by and large, I wouldn't characterize this as living like these naked and afraid lives. We haven't been naked. I mean, when was the last time we were naked? I mean, we've been making clothes for so long. It's just, it's absurd. So anyway, we end up having these um, caricature ideas about our, our caveman past that are so flawed. And, and it seems like, um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, my friend Sam Thayer releasing this book. He's been writing on anthropology's backgrounds because boy, were there some, you know, just the literature so tainted with these uh, early impressions that came from a very specific worldview, but reality is a lot different. And it, you know, as you know, it turns out most of these people are much happier, <laughs> much more productive, uh, much more relaxed and very well nourished and fed. So it's not like we're running around hungry and scared all the time, right? No, absolutely. Yeah, well said, very well said. So I, I mentioned a few minutes ago about oxalates, man. I, um, I had been hearing the, these rumblings about this for a while. You know, I try to stay out of the diet world now. I just like, I'm burned out on it after a few decades of it. It's just like, oh mm-hmm. man, I can't get into these arguments anymore. Or like listen to, all, you know, especially watching all this novel stuff. Cause I just sort of felt like, all right, there's nothing new here. Like I'm not expecting any new dietary developments, but I start hearing this thing about oxalates and I'm thinking initially like, oh, this is paleo people or sorry, uh, uh, carnivore people looking for a reason to make plants the, the bad guy. So I just mm-hmm. kind of ignored it. And I also thought to myself, man, uh, from what I know about foraging, oxalates are pretty significant in many um, wild foods that we 
eat today and have eaten for a long time. So I thought, oh, this can't possibly be reality. And I had this conversation with Sally Norton, who um, just kind of, man, she's committed to this idea. So I really had to take some time to think about it. Um, and then I started to think maybe some of the symptoms that I've been experiencing come from that. So I've, I've been cutting, you know, uh, first of all, uh, I unabashedly eat tremendous amounts of cacao. So um, I, don't see that cha- <laughs> I don't see that changing. And I'm like, you know, whatever, I, I can definitely tolerate some of this. But uh, I've cut way back on things like almonds and cashews and chia seeds and things, you know, that that I know are really high in it. Uh, and man, a lot of joint pain disappearing. So I'm curious if you could give us maybe, you know, because you've you just put out a spice blend. It looks like everything except the oxalates, I think you call it. <laughs> and, yep. uh, so, you know, feel free to tell us about that. And then, and then the evolution of this idea from your perspective and your experience and what you think about the whole thing. We'll get right back to the show in a moment, but first, hunting season is right around the corner. If you dream of being able to successfully and sustainably harvest food from the land, this might be your perfect next step. Learning to hunt can be overwhelming, especially without a mentor. From finding land to hunt on, to developing the skills, to learning to process your harvest and finding people with shared values you can hunt with. The Hunter's Journey is a thriving online course and community with mentors ready to guide you from where you are now to becoming a successful hunter. Their team believes in stewardship of the land, reverence for the species that they hunt, and respect for all people. Many of their students got out on their first successful hunts last season, utilizing what they'd learned through the hunter's journey. And remember, even if you're not quite ready to harvest an animal yourself, you can apply these same skills to shooting with your camera. The hunter's journey has a special offer just for wild fed listeners. Visit thehuntersjourney.com and enter the coupon code wildfed 100 to get a hundred dollars off the course again that's the hunters journey.com and the coupon code is wildfed 100 now back to the show thank you for giving me time to speak about this um my life has changed in the last five years <clears throat> because of my awareness of the oxalates and uh, very quick before i start uh, about a month or so ago i was speaking at KetoCon, and we had my wife and i had a booth set up as well in the in the vendor hall and during my presentation, I mentioned oxalates briefly in passing about something. And then during the Q&A at the end, there were a bunch of questions about them, which you know I fielded as best I could. And what I returned to at my table was a line 20 deep of <laughs> people in tears. Some of them finally putting two and two together about symptoms they've been experiencing and, and the foods that might have been responsible for it. And The other half of them, really, people that were just sharing their story with me, that the same thing, they figured it out three, four, or five years ago, um, and their life has been completely transformed. And it just blew me away. And and, and really, it took a lot to to stand up at a keto conference and say something bad about almond flour. (laughs) Really, really was a a tough (laughs) tough big lift. (laughs) um, It it was fascinating to me. So let let me, if 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 I can, real quick, um, share a little bit of my story with Oxalates. Please, please. so I grew up in a house. My parents uh, were very health conscious, um, listening to everything that they were told about, you know, had to, had to nourish their family. And at the time, things like spinach were big and nut butters and that sort of thing. So I grew up with a lot of that, a lot of kale, a lot of Swiss chard, a lot of spinach, um, a lot of nuts. And I experienced some things that looking back now, I'm confident were oxalate toxicity related. But the biggest issue, and I think you, you'll, you'll appreciate this, um, the, the, the first major life-altering issue happened, oh, I forget, maybe uh, over 10 years ago or so. Um, a buddy of mine, real good buddy of mine from graduate school, Tim Messner, he's a, he's a professor at uh, SUNY Potsdam, archaeologist. We were in grad school together. And we had uh, co-authored a paper for the Journal of, Ar- Journal of Archaeological Science on uh, Arrow Arum, or Peltonja virginica, which is a, a marshland plant that um, John Smith uh, talks about in a lot of his in, in his logs about how he, he would come up to Chesapeake and see Native Americans who were you know fin- co- coming out of the winter. Uh, it's one of the first. It, it j- just like skunk cabbage. It's one of the first plants that appear in early spring, and they're That's in the, the marshes. The name of this plant. Arrow arum is the common name, or Peltonja virginica is the. Um, is the genus of species. Okay. And it, it, it chokes up marshlands. It's, it, it's massive, especially here on the East coast. And the roots are as big as oh, your it's leg. Wapa- it's Wapato. 
No, Wapato is nowhere near as toxic. Wapato's um, Sagittaria, right? Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. I'm looking at the leaves here, and it's, it's okay. very similar looking leaves. Um, so he records them eating massive quantities of this, and and records documents a little bit of how they might have processed it because it is full of calcium oxalate raphides. And the toxin, these calcium oxalate raphides, if you look at them under a microscope, are these little bundles of these bipointed microscopic needles. And at the end of them is this protease compound, right? So it's actually a double, to- it, it, it's, it's toxic because of two things. So first, if you ingest them, um, these bipointed needles pierce your throat and then it releases this protease compound. And it, it, it feels like you've drank Tabasco sauce, your throat swells up, you can't breathe anymore and you die. They're nasty, nasty things. So we wanted to, if they really were such a uh, important food resource in the past here, um, we wanted to better understand how they might have been processed and also uh, uh, see if there's any archeological signature to the different processing methods. And if we could look into the ground and say, hey, not only were they eating this, but this is how they were processing it. So we did a, ran a whole bunch of experiments for a long time, collected massive quantities of this. I did at one point try it a tiniest bit, and man, it did taste like I, or it felt like I put Tabasco sauce down my throat. But we ended up um, publishing this article. Um, it, it, was, it was really well received and, and peer reviewed and all this. And then a buddy of mine who's an amazing forager, uh, said to me, uh, we, were, we were going to a, an event later on that year, and he said, hey, you know, uh, I uh, skunk cabbage has the same issues as this does with the, with the uh, raphides. And he says, I, you know, sometimes I take um, some of my forage plants and I make these broths out of them. And, uh, you know, maybe if we made a broth out of it, then the toxin would stay behind and we could drink the broth and get some flavor, nutrition, all this. He said, I'm going to give it a go. You're up for it. I'm like, yeah, sure. This is this is probably closer to 15 years ago. Anyhow, I, I wasn't very smart to do. So we, we drank this. And um, the next day, I had a bunch of students. On an, I was teaching an archaeology field school here in the Eastern Shore, and we were digging this uh, this site. And all day long, in the, in the heat, I'm jumping on shovels, and you know, we're, we're being really physical and doing all the things we would do on a site. Anyhow, and I'm driving the students back in the van, and I felt like I broke my foot. And as uh, all day I was getting wet, I'm like, man, did I just jump on a shovel the wrong way, or did something fall on my foot? I don't remember. We were doing stuff all day long, and I dropped the students off at the dorm. And I called my wife. I said, "It's so bad. I'm going to the hospital to get an X-ray." So I went to the I went to the hospital, and we're in a, a small little rural area here in a little tiny hospital. And I go in and I said, "Hey, I think I broke my foot." And they give me an X-ray and they said, "Hey, there's nothing wrong with your foot. Uh, you have gout." And I said, "Gout? Man, I do not have." I actually was insulted. They said that to me. <laughs> I mean, can I gout be they, seen? He, can gout be seen, or does it just get diagnosed based on symptoms? It gets diagnosed based on symptoms, but what they didn't do and they should have done, there's four different kinds of gout. Everybody, um, almost everybody when they think gout, including these doctors, think gout from uric acid. Um, yeah, they right should have given me a uric acid test, which they never did. Um, they, all they did was they said, your, 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 your big toe hurts to the point of you think you broke your foot. There's no bo- broken bones. You must have gout. That literally was the process. And they wanted to put me on all this medicine, and I said no, and Anyhow, I leave, and it and it took forever to, to mitigate the issues of it, and then it, it hung around for years. I mean, years. But most importantly, not most importantly, but one of the biggest issues was mentally this you know this struggle with. I know that that meat and organ meats and and, and fat, everything they tell you that you shouldn't be, be eating if you have gout. I know in my heart of hearts that this is the food that should be nourishing me and everybody's telling me I shouldn't be eating it. And I got this chronic problem with my foot and it, it, you know, it was going on for for a long time. Um, and the other thing that happened at the same exact time, it caused you to have doubts about what you were doing. Cause Oh, cause like, daily. like you just said, I mean, that's, what's interesting is that, that if you ask somebody how to get gout, they would basically tell you a diet like that. And, uh, and the other side of that is the very diet they told me to eat is one that, is full of <laughs> nothing know, but oxygen. <laughs> yeah, so, so anyway, I was struggling with this for a very long time. But the other issue that happened literally the same time. Now, I have um, from a, from something from a long time. I have uh, corneal transplants in both my eyes from like 20, 20 something years ago, um, and have had no issues with them at all. The same time that this was going on with my foot, um, I started to get incredibly light sensitive to the point where 
it was so bad. I would sit on the couch with my wife to watch TV and I was wearing two pairs of sunglasses, like one on top of the other. And my eyes were no. split. My eyes were tearing. To watch it television? Was, to watch TV. It was so bad. And every day it got worse. And eventually one day, again, I was leaving the field school. I'm driving home and I couldn't. I couldn't drive anymore. I pulled over to the side of the road. I couldn't even dial the phone to call my wife. I couldn't see. It was so bad. And I went up to my corneal specialist, who's an amazing guy. And I'm like, listen, man, um, I, I can't keep my eyes open. And he looks he looks at the transplants that he gave me, you know, earlier. He says, nothing's wrong with your eyes. And I'm sitting there. I can't even look at him. Um, and I'm just, literally, my tears are like, it was like I was weeping. My tears are coming down my face. And I said, well, something's wrong. And he's like, well, there's nothing wrong with your eyes. Um, I don't know what it is. And he gave me a medicine called Keterolac, these eye drops. He says, this isn't going to solve anything, but this is going to numb your eyes. And I don't want you, so you're not going to feel the symptoms, but it isn't fixing whatever the problem is. And I want to, you know, use this as a temporary relief. And I um, I, I want to get him off you, get you off it as soon as possible. I said, absolutely. It was the, It's the only medicine in the world that I've ever taken long term. So I went home with these and they, and they did help. I take them twice a day. And I took them for years and I kept trying to get off them. I couldn't get off them. And I mean, seven, eight years later, I couldn't go a day without these drops. Uh, it was so terribly bad. So this is all happening. And then uh, more recently, uh, just a few years ago, I was getting ready to go to uh, to spend some time in Bolivia and Peru to do some research on, on uh, potato, um, traditional potato processing with some uh, Quechua and Aymara Indian family, native families. And... I was about to go and I had had for about a year this persistent neck pain that was just, and I know this sounds crazy, but it's all going to come together in a minute, that came out of nowhere and it was always there, always nagging me, um, always in the back of my mind, but it wasn't bad enough that I really thought there was a big issue. And we had the week, uh, a couple of days before I was leaving for Bolivia and Peru, um, a friend of ours from Africa came and she had just recovered from bacterial meningitis. And she was telling us that... Um, you know, the symptoms of bacterial meningitis and her, you know, this aching in her neck. And I knew I didn't have bacterial <laughs> meningitis. I, I'd be dead if I had after a year, but it's just somebody's talking about it and getting it in your head. And I'm thinking to myself, my God, I have a whole family. I'm about to go in, literally in the mountains forever in the middle of nowhere. And if there's something wrong with me, I want to know. So I, I had my wife take me to the hospital. They did CAT scans and MRIs and they came back and said, there is nothing wrong with you. There's literally nothing wrong with you. And they thought I was crazy. So anyhow, fast forward. And uh, a few years ago, I was doing kind of the summit like thing. And I was going to interview Sally Norton uh, for it. And it was kind of a pre interview thing. And I was I had heard her on a podcast with, with Brian Sanders a little earlier. And, and I'm, I'm talking to her just in this quick 15, 20 minute conversation. And at the end of it, things started to click. And I said, Hey, I got a question for you. And I started to tell her the story about that plant, that Peltonja virginica and the skunk cabbage and all this. And she finished the story. She was like, they told you you had gout, right? And I said, yeah. And uh, they said, she said, it, it, did they test it for uric acid? I said, no. She said it was probably oxalate um, gout. It wasn't, it wasn't gout gout. Um, and the diet they told you to go on was the exact wrong one. So I said, oh, my gosh. So I hung up the phone and I told my wife. Then I started researching other oxalate issues. And, and one of the places that they get deposited and cause massive trauma is in your corneas. And then I, the neck pain, all of this started coming together. And I immediately. So, so, sorry, the, I just back up. The, the raffines, is that what they're called? Yeah, the raffides. Yep. Raffides. They accumulate in the cornea or. Because one thing that I was a little, I left that conversation a little unclear on. You've got macro structures, crystalline structures that are uric. I mean, sorry, um, that are um, oxalic acid plus, let's say, calcium. Right. So you're going to get that calcium oxalate, or or that in that crystal form can you know in mass into a stone, let's say, in the kidney. But then you also have the free acidic form as well that is not. That's in solution, right? So is it two different things or one thing or are there lots of different types of raffines? I get a little confused on this. What's accumulating in the cornea? And then this this culprit can come in a couple of a, a solid form and a solubilized form, right? Right. They can come. And I will tell you right now, I am not the expert on on the part you're asking me now at all. Um, but I can tell you what, what happened with me. Who is yeah, that person? Come different, <laughs> <laughs> it can come in different forms. Uh, some are soluble, some are insoluble. Um, the, the, the two major issues that they cause are one, um, if it isn't already bound up to calcium uh, it can, or, or, or magnesium or, or other things, it will rob your body of it, right? So 
that's one of the issues with it. It'll rob your body of calcium to buffer the essentially to to create a, a salt form. Yeah, it's it's looking to bond, so yeah, it yeah, will bond. Can, like like oxalic acid in your mouth is like, hey, teeth, and starts pulling away at calcium, right? Perfect. Yeah, exactly. So it will rob your body if 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 you're consuming it with calcium, it'll. I, I understand yeah. it will bind there, bind to, yeah. But right. if it's not, it's in your body. It will do it inside, so it, it can cause issues that way. But the more, to me, the more immediate issue that I think we all need to at least realize can be a problem is when you exceed the amount your body can take care of on a, on a regular basis. And that isn't very much. Um, it doesn't take much to exceed that limit. It, it will go to different places in your body, extremities, um, kidneys, uh, areas that have received trauma before, uh, corneas, a lot of times in your pelvis, which, and, and, and I'll continue the story in just a second. And especially I understand, and again, I'm not the expert on this, um, but, um, there's a lot of uh, women experience, a, men can too, but women can experience a lot of pelvic pain um, from this. And I'm not exactly you sure. You mean like urogenital? Exactly like you don't mean, like she was saying that as well. And I'm and obviously we're not talking about somebody's, uh, you know, ischial tuberosities or their ilium or, or their pubic bone or symphysis. We're talking about, is this urogenital stuff we're talking about? Yes, I, th- I believe so. Uh, and, and actually, I, let me let me tell you a little bit more about what happened to me and then come back to that because it is related to, to what you just asked. So I cut I, – I, and then I, I start looking at what this oxalate thing is and I um, I start cutting as much as I can out. And it wasn't hard because I wasn't at the time – it didn't look like I was eating a lot of different oxalates. I, I don't like spinach that much anyhow, but I did cut spinach out obviously. But it turns out almonds were my go-to. Almonds, I would have a handful of almonds at least once a day. Sometimes that was my go to snack. That was my low carb, high protein, good fat, you know, sort of snack that I would, it would I would go to for years. In fact, you know, me eating nuts was kind of the joke. If, if we got it, you know, we stop at Wawa or 7 Eleven and we get on a road trip, the kids would get whatever, and I'd always get a bag of nuts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought I was doing the right thing, I was poisoning myself. So I cut those out, uh, and in a very short period of time, I, for the first time in my life, I didn't have to take that drop anymore. I mean, for for years, seven, eight years, wow. I didn't have to take that drop. And that now is, I don't know, four years ago, something like that. It's been years. And I've taken one drop in, what, four or five years. It's been amazing. The pain's gone away from my neck and has never returned. Um, the, the, the foot thing is almost completely cleared up. I mean, once every three months, I might just feel a tingle in my foot when I get up in the morning, but that's completely gone. Um, the problem, though, with... You know, there's so many problems with oxalates. One is, uh, it's not that you, it's not like eating a bad mushroom and you know about it fairly quickly. This is something where you're eating this and you're eating it and you're being told it's healthy and you eat massive quantities of it. And months, years, decades later, you start feeling the effects. That's what's frustrating to me about this thing because, you know, I I tend to have, like a lot of people who probably listen to this because they're into food, I've got a pretty good sensory system for if food is good for me or not. And this is so so phantom to me. So when I'm telling, she's telling me this list of foods and I'm like, oh, that's, that's my morning smoothie. You know, I was like every day for many, I mean, for probably two years, every day I was soaked, you know, and, and other times in my life too. But in this recent round, a lot of soaked chia seeds every day. And she was like, man, that's why we're having this podcast, just so you can find out to not do that anymore. <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't know if I'm going to stop, but I stopped. And yeah, like you're saying, like a lot of stuff clearing up, but I always, I look at chia seeds and I, and I get like a happy face. Like, I don't think negative. I think like, oh, those always make me feel good. So it's, it's they're hydrating. They're, yeah, they're, they got great, you know, essential fats. Like it's confusing because there's a lot of foods that I can eat and immediately tell you like, that's not good for me. I can just, that mm-hmm. gut intelligence, you know, from all of those neurons in your, in your gut. But this one is, is a creeper and I just couldn't tell. And that's one, and I'm of the same mindset. You know, we, you and I both, we love to forage. We love wild plants. I feel, and, I, and I've been foraging now for what, 30, 39 years. And I feel like I have that sort of bodily reaction. I mean, I know what, tannic acid feels like in my body. I know what these different, you know, plant toxins, you know, if, I just, if it goes to my tongue or, or it, what it sort of feels like, these are foods that don't do that, right? These are, these are foods, that, if anything, 
I experience pleasure from eating, or yeah, at least short term pleasure from eating these foods. And it turns out I've been so it, it was hard for me to wrap my brain around. And I know for a lot of people listening to this, it sounds like snake oil or, or witchcraft or, or something like, oh, just another fad. But the more that I've dove into it, the more that I've realized, not only from my own personal experience, but it, it, it makes a lot of sense. And one of the real big dangers is that so many of these foods that are so super high in oxalates are right now being touted as incredible superfoods. Super foods. Super a foods. lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah. And, and what, it was also confusing to me to realize that because I had been asked previous to Sally coming on the show, I'd mentioned it and some people had reached out and said, can you get, you know, what's her working list of foods? And and that kind of led to the conversation that there's not a real good list and the numbers aren't consistent and obviously mm-hmm. foods vary, you know, anyway. So um, it, it can be a little bit difficult to even know which foods are the culprits. Um, it seems like there's some consensus on some things, but not on others. It, it is. One of the other problems, and I've talked to her quite a bit about this. And I, So my first reaction to her was, okay, what did people do in the past? <laughs> like, Yeah, that, they that's where did, I started. I was like, when did this become such a big problem? Because people have been eating this stuff for a long time. Right. And and one of her answers uh, really struck home to me, and especially she, I think we were talking about it in relation to spinach. She's like, listen, you know, spinach isn't that bad. Like if you eat spinach – for the two weeks out of the year that it actually would grow in your area, right. it's not a big deal. But we have taken the seasons out of the restaurants, touted these things as superfoods, made them available year round. And there are not only people eating them every day, there are people eating spinach twice a day. It's in the smoothie in the morning and it's in their, you know, their yeah. lunch in the afternoon as a salad. And that's where a lot of those problems come from. Not um, to mention they, too, like uh, I was just at a forager friend's house and he had um, hickory nuts that he, you know, they're big part of their family's life. And so he's got this box of hickory nuts and there's a couple of hammers on a stone and you can kind of go over there, crack a few, pick them out, eat them. That's a lot different than having a satchel full. Like the number <laughs> of almonds that you can go, go to the Seven Eleven and get in one bag is like, you know, a couple of hours worth of processing if you did it by hand. And mm-hmm. so it's a lot easier to eat a lot more of these. Not only are they more available, but you're, when you're not doing the physical processing, suddenly your appetite for them, you know, could basically you ha- you can go until you're mechanically stuffed if you want. 100%. So we've taken the seasons out of the grocery stores, can ship stuff all over the world, make it available all year round. We've taken the labor and the hard part out of it. And in fact, the only other sort of limiting mechanism that was there maybe would have been price. Like if the almonds cost that much to get to Maryland in the middle of, you know, whatever the off season, then that might have, you know, might have been a limiting factor to keep some of them out of our diets, you know, year round at a massive quantity. But now we can go to Costco or BJ's and buy these huge bags of almonds for 10 bucks. And and on top of getting rid of all the, the, the sort of limiting mechanisms that would have held them at a certain level in our diets, we're touting them as superfoods. And we have these fad diets that are that are you know pushing. Okay, we're going to get all of our protein or all of our whatever from from this particular source, and people are eating mass upon it. She might have told you, and, and you might be aware of it, but there are kids now for the first time ever presenting with kidney stones under the age of ten. Yeah, because yeah. they're growing up in houses with all they're drinking almond milk, the same quantity they would have been drinking cow's milk twenty years. Just ago. Just sucks that it's in these health conscious families too. You know. I, I've known so many people I would describe as having an adult failure to thrive um, who were raised in vegan and vegetarian families. And uh, their parents were believing themselves to be doing like everything right. In fact, the amount of work and focus and study and time and food processing that went into making this lifestyle possible, I mean, they were just dedicated. And then it turns out like, oh, hey, we figured out most of that's wrong. Sorry about your kids. You know what I mean? It's just, it's yeah. sad because, you know, in some cases you almost get better results on a standard American diet than you could do on these extreme health diets. And that's absolutely, that's sad. Yeah. You know. So for the people that are listening that are, are okay, they might've heard Sally's and might've heard a little bit of my story um, with it. I know some of it sounds extreme because it's going against every single thing that we're listening to in the media and the doctors are telling us and the dietitians and nutritionists are telling us. Well, but we know they're wrong, though. <laughs> yeah, yes. but, but we're so many, many of us are still listening to them. But here's here's the thing. You know, we are we have never been sicker as a species than we are right now, ever. In the history of the world, we've never been sicker as a species. Mm-hmm. And it's m- not all of it, but a large part of it is due 
to the way we're feeding ourselves. And, you know, this is happening. It's constant. And, and, and it's the things that are happening that are causing all these issues have to just sort of be sitting there under the radar and they should come as they should. It's not weird that they're coming as a surprise to us as something like this oxalate issue, because they're there, you know, those things are there and oxalates aren't the only issue for sure. But I do hope that they get the recognition they deserve right now to make people aware of them because, um, you know, so many of us are, are literally trying to do the right thing with ourselves or with our families and we really should be questioning some of it. But you're right. Some some of those issues, we don't know the exact numbers on all this. And again, you know, it's not that you eat the oxalates and you're sick three hours later and you can put two and two together. This is a long term thing. Yeah. Bioaccumulation but, issue. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then the other issue, and I'm sure she mentioned it, is when you if you have an oxalate toxicity issue, which I believe so many of us do today and don't even realize it, that. Um, if you get to that point and you go cold turkey and don't eat any oxalates, you feel amazing for like a week. And then all of a sudden your body says, okay, now it's great. I can start releasing these oxalates that we have stored and you hit a crash. And sometimes that crash can be at, 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 um, at minimum painful, um, but at maximum, uh, very dangerous. So it has to be a slow sort of, um, you can't just go cold turkey. It could have devastating results. Um, and it's it's a long term thing. Yeah, she talked about some. Man, I'm always so hesitant on this stuff. I've just seen so much bullshit in my lifetime. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, do you remember there was a cleanse that was real popular where you would do? I think it would be bentonite clay, psyllium husk, apple pectin, and of course that you you'd shit out like a giant jello mold of your. <laughs> And then people will be like, that stuff's been in you for years. And it's like, no, dude, that's bentonite clay, psyllium husk, and apple pectin in the shape of your colon. That's not in there. Like, you can't have 40 pounds of ropey material. That's just makes that's not possible. Like, we do colonoscopies. We would know. You know what I mean? Like, but people will buy into stuff. Like, so I'm, I'm a little hesitant because of the charlatanism. You know, that makes me a, a little skeptical. And then it's like, if we're still talking about this in 10 years, then okay, that gives it a little more credence because the number of things that that blow through the dietary fad world, you know, I, I'm hesitant to jump on board with a lot of these things. Um, that said, I am aware of plants like Jack in the Pulpit or Rhubarb that can very seriously yeah. harm you because of their oxalates. So it's not like this is an unknown thing. Um, two, two things I want to bring up. Well, one, um, I'll say them both now. We can take them one at a time. Sure, sure, sure. One she mentioned to me in passing but I, but of course, given my my interests and I think yours too, I kind of glommed onto this idea. She mentioned that per, there may be a bacteria or maybe a suite of bacteria that are oxalate consuming that are very sensitive to antibiotics. Um, that would because I said to her, "Look, like you got to. I'm sorry, get me over this hump." But hunter gatherer peoples were very healthy peoples eating probably pretty high oxalate diets in some cases or foods. Um, how come they weren't having this problem and when did this problem begin? And she said, you know, that that might be a factor. So of course, as I've talked to folks, some folks do the thing of like, well, we got to create a probiotic. And I'm like, I'm just not convinced that probiotics set up quite, they work quite that well, but you know, maybe, uh, maybe you could be inoculated with this, but do you know anything about that? Um, that's the first question anyway. No, I've, I've, I've heard the same thing. I, it isn't, again, this isn't my, in my wheelhouse other than my yeah, own personal experience with it. So I don't know. I have heard that. I've also, there, there are also situations um, where we in our own internally in our own bodies, and, and there's actually a, a name for it when we produce oxalates inside of our bodies and can, and can mm-hmm. compound the issue or, and sometimes even make it worse. And, and, and people that have that issue, the dietary oxalates are the least of their, <laughs> least of their problems. Yeah. Uh, what they're doing in, internally is, is even worse. But, and there's some suggestions that there's a lot of ways to sort of combat the oxalates. And, and here's where I have sort of, uh, you know, dove down a, a rabbit hole and, and, and tried to figure some of this out. I I am of the mindset that all plants have some level of toxin in them. And I'm also of the mindset that we have spent millions of years creating technologies to make plants safe and nourishing for our bodies before we consume them. So there are things we can do like fermentation or leaching or whatever, depending on the toxin to help mitigate the issues there. 
I haven't found, I found three peer reviewed articles that suggest that fermentation might play a small role in helping um, with the detoxification of oxalates, but sense. not at any meaningful level. Uh, so, but oh, okay. th there still might be something out there and, and, and there has to be, there, there has to be something out there, but I do think it's, it's a number of different factors that can cause these issues. So one massive consumption of oxalates on a regular daily basis over years is, is more than would have been historically possible probably. Yes. And certainly, you know, animals are, when we think about these things prehistorically are wild resources. Animals are, I mean, certainly animals migrate for sure, but animals in general as a resource are available year round and plants are incredibly seasonal. Uh, and, and the other thing that we know about the oxalates in the plants is that they, since they are protective, they're created by the plants to, for a couple of different reasons. They help with some um, uh, mineral regulation and, and other things they help with structure some people think but they're really the main priority really is as a toxin to protect themselves to protect themselves um different parts of the plants produce sometimes different shaped oxalates but also different amounts of oxalates so you you often wouldn't find the oxalates um like in a fruit for instance there's not a whole lot of oxalates compared to another part of a plant where it really needs to protect itself it wants the fruit wants it's the supposed to get eaten, eaten. right animals so, seed not only do you have a seasonality aspect to the diet that has certain plants coming in and then coming out of our diets, you know, some may be more ox higher oxalates and lower oxalates, but also the parts of those plants um, that are available in an edible and safe state are also changing. You know, there's a season for fruits. There's a season for shoots. There's a season for, you know, these sorts of things. So I really think that um, even though, many of these wild plants might have higher oxalate contents than some of our domesticated plants. They're being eaten in a different manner than we're eating spinach. Well, you know, this is one of the things where I had to kind of call bullshit though, because she was saying, well, raspberries are really high in them. And I was like, well, man, I mean, I really like eating raspberries. And she's like, well, you know, how many would you eat in nature? You know, you'd walk by, eat a handful and move on. And she's like, it's not like you'd be gathering these things in mass quantity. And I was like, eh, sorry, no, that's not right. I mean, people... <laughs> People would gather things in massive quantity when available as huge groups, and they would bring right. these things back and store them for use throughout the year. This is something we've done a long time, and it's not like this is speculative. I mean, we find caches that have gone unrecovered. Sure. You know, We know that this is what people do. And so I had a lot of people reach out to me and be like, hey, I, that, it was a really inter interesting interview, but like bullshit on the raspberry thing. Like, that well, make any sense. And here's where you make such a great point. Here's where I think we need a lot more work with uh, with this topic. So number one, and I feel the same way about archeology span and, and interpreting the past and doing all those sorts of things. We need experts coming from a, you know, with a lot of different backgrounds coming together to engage in this conversation. Um, you need uh, a forager like you talking about, you know, and I know we, we go out and collect Just like you need a primitive what skills person to, to flesh out, like when an archeologist is making assumptions about how stone was napped. Yes. It's like, Hey, why don't we just like go talk to someone who's doing it? Because, you know, that's an important perspective, right? So same thing. If we're going to talk, Absolutely. if we're going to be speculative about ancient diets, it'd be helpful to talk to people who eat wild foods today. Well, exactly. And, and, but, and here's the other piece to that and where it comes in with the raspberries and, and these sorts of things, there's not enough the hard data and, and nobody can agree on, you know, exactly the same amount of oxalates in, in certain foods. Some of them have never been tested. Um, but the other thing that I think we need to figure out is, all right, just because there's an oxalate in a raspberry seed, does that mean it gets inside of my body? Because a, a, a seed is physically and chemically designed to withstand our digestive tract and come out the other end. So, you know, a great example uh, is, is a kiwi. Kiwi seeds are loaded with oxalates. Now, people, and she writes uh, about this and speaks about it. If, if, you, if you take a kiwi and put it in a blender, and drink it, a lot of people have an immediate reaction. Their lips swell up, oh, their throat swells no up. Oh, no way. Okay. And because the oxalates are in the seeds, right? So I'm wondering if, it, you know, if, if a kiwi oxalates are primarily in the seeds, and, you're, and I don't know this answer, but this is the kind of thing we have to, you know, are, are the seeds, are, are the oxalates staying in those seeds or primarily and, and coming, passing through our bodies? But if we hit it in a blender because of the processing, then are, have we ever then released them? And the same sort of thing with raspberries and, and, and the like. I, I don't know that answer. 
But as somebody who just purchased a new carafe for my Vitamix blender, I want to know the answer because <laughs> I love to, I like to put things, and I'm always of the mindset that if I can liberate the oils in the seeds or the, if I can liberate the amino acids in the seeds, I'm getting more out of the plant. But this, you know, that's a really great point. Um, and I had said before, I had two questions. I think the other one, because sure. the other question that immediately comes up for me. So I, I think one is like, what are my body body's mechanisms for dealing with this? There has to be some in place. We've just been eating plants too long to not have some ability to deal with this. So, you know, maybe it's that bacteria, maybe it's something else. Maybe we had a food technology that we don't remember anymore. Uh, or yeah, I, I, I do think there's some, there has to be some kind of technology or technologies that can help. Um, yeah. Well, you'd think I, even I, just like you mentioned about calcium, like let's say it was that, like for instance, let's say that somewhere they, they were eating, you know, limestone, powdered limestone with a food, for instance, to try to create that calcium oxalate in the gut and let it pass through. Like, you know, that I'm just making that up. You know, I sound like Trump talking about bleach, but like just making <laughs> stuff up. Uh, but like saying like maybe there's a way to buffer. So that could be one way that we dealt with it, right? Absolutely. Or, and there is some suggestions that cooking with dairy, like spinach cooked with cream is supposed that to be a little bit different for, for that very reason. Yeah. Okay. And so the other question that emerges for me is like, how, how do we excrete it? Because it's like, things are only coming out so many ways, right? You're going to poop it out. You're going to pee it out. You're going to sweat it out. You're going to breathe it out. Maybe you could cry it out. I don't know, but you only have a few, ch- you, you got basically four channels um, that things can be excreted from your body through, right? Through the skin, through the colon, through the kidneys, through the lungs. Uh, so, right. you know, how, do you know, or, or do you know who knows how we, what are those channels? How do we excrete it? Does the sauna help? Is it just shitting? Is it just peeing? Is it <laughs> exhaling them? Like, how do we get these things out of ourselves in some kind of meaningful way? You know, one, I would think that skin excretes it based on some of the detoxification symptoms she mentioned. But, um, you know, I think a lot of people are wondering like, okay, so rather than just like waiting for this stuff to come out, can I accelerate it by accelerating those, those, um, you know, channels, uh, in their excretion? So I, and again, I can speak to you from personal experience and from what I do know, and I don't want to overstate where my knowledge base is on this, but I'm over the understanding that the, the normal amount of oxalates that your body can deal with on its own, um, gets excreted. I'm confident. I'm pretty confident through both your feces and your urine on regularly, like on a daily basis, the part that it's right, dealt right. With. like an ongoing um, kind of painting the Golden right. Gate Bridge kind of style thing. The part the, the stuff that is in your body and in your tissues and in your organs and, 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 and then, you know, when you go on a low oxy diet, then gets excreted, can get excreted through all of the things you mentioned earlier. Um, Mm -hmm. I have heard stories about it getting excreted through the corneas, which is incredibly painful um, and experienced myself coming through the skin. So I've seen pictures of this um, happening. It can happen anywhere, but we recently, uh, we were actually, believe it or not, we we took our youngest daughter down to Disney a few, uh, about a month and a half, two months ago. Um, And Sally talks about how, uh, and so many of the the people that she helps and, and deals with, uh, the, some of the worst things happen about three years after they cut oxalates out of their diets. I mean, oh, they, no they, way. Some of it comes out of their body. Oh, yeah. And she says this repeatedly. And I will tell you. More bad um, news. <laughs> more bad news. Um, I I had a dumping. My first dumping ever was uh, we, we were literally at Disney. And I and I had, had all this pain all the way around my mouth, like almost as if I had a goatee, like that whole area there. Um, and I looked in the mirror and it looked like, I had had a sunburn and then all of a sudden, you know, all the skin was peeling off, but I grabbed it and it was gritty like sand. It was, and for three days, it was excreting painfully through my skin around my mouth. And then it just stopped and went away. But you you think those oxalate crystals were the grit? Yeah, well, I'm com- I'm 100% confident that's what they were. Yeah, and I, I don't even know what analyze they- this material. <laughs> I do have a picture of it, but I don't. You know, I it's how hard with here. anecdote. It's not like I don't believe you. It's just like, but, you know, it is an anecdote. So it's like, oh, I really wish we yeah. had data. You know, this would be so fascinating. I know. I know. Well, at least my daughter made me take a picture of it. But, yeah. That's um, <laughs> I, 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 again, I know it sounds crazy, but I will say this. If, if anybody was trying, you know, if, if we were on having this conversation and we ended it with, okay, Here's the here's the thing you should you know the pill you need to take from buy from me so that you can solve all these oxalate issues and I spent an hour talking with you building up that sales pitch 
I, I'd be incredibly skeptical. Um, everybody should be, and they probably shouldn't buy anything from me. But I can promise you that I'm not selling you anything <laughs> as, as right. a result of this. <laughs> this doesn't um, turn into a supplement at the end. Yeah, and I, and I'm not, and I'm also not even suggesting that, and, and nowhere's near that I that I or anybody fully understands this oxalate issue. The only, the two things I'm suggesting is one, we need to look into it deeper, and in, in a very skeptical way, surely, but look into it deeper, and. I am convinced that a lot of the issues that I've had that have gone undiagnosed or that I couldn't, I didn't know how to deal with, maybe not all of them, and I don't have that many, but all the ones that I have had have cleared up and gotten better uh, when I uh, kept oxalates at a very low level in my diet. And I'll also say, you know, I've had them out of, pr primarily out of my diet for years now. And I am eating an incredibly varied, happy diet on a regular basis. It's not, you know, I'm not just sitting here eating pork rinds and beef jerky. <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely not eating almond flour. Uh, I, I definitely am not eating almond flour. Yeah. What are your top culprit foods? And, um, and then are there any that you are tuned into? You know, because like, for instance, uh, from what I understand, like star fruits, one of the worst, but most of us, that's not a cornerstone of anybody's diet, right? Not here. Right. We're not around here. Um, but almonds, you know, that really stands out. Spinach, Swiss charts stand out. So are there any that really stand out for you as the, as big, obvious ones to avoid for people who are new to this idea? And then are there any that you're like, Oh, most people don't think about this one, but this one might be an issue for you. Yeah. So the, chia seed, that's a surprise. Wow. So yeah, see, see, and here's the hard part. I love, I absolutely love nuts. And part of it is I love the flavor. I love the texture. I love all of that. And it's also sort of, um, not nostalgic, but that was my go-to. Like I'd get in the car right on a family trip, I'd have some nuts, right? And or so it, it it even mentally is challenging to not have them in my diet as much as I have have in the past. It's not all nuts, but well, all nuts have them at some level, but some are much worse than others. Almonds are incredibly bad, as you said. Swiss chard, uh, spinach, incredibly bad. Beets, and I love beets. Um, beets are beets Swiss both chard. The, beets are the same plant yeah, as yeah, Swiss chard. Yeah, so. All parts of the beet plant um, uh, is bad. And, uh, and the reason we put out that everything spice that you were mentioning earlier is that poppy seeds and sesame seeds are incredibly high. There was an article written in the 90s where at the time when they were just you know testing some different things, uh, the researchers that wrote this article thought sesame seeds were the highest food possible. Um, wow. And they are very high, but they're not – uh, but I think uh, I forget the numbers, but poppy seeds were like three times higher than, 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 than the sesame seeds. And the reason that I thought it was important is, you know, we're sitting here and we're doing everything we can to, to make incredibly nourishing food. And we make this awesome sourdough cracker and we make these amazing sourdough bagels, you know, long, slow fermented. We're boiling them in lye. We're doing the whole thing and we're topping them. With and, and everything bagel is topped with a lot of spice. I mean, it's literally like tablespoons worth of spice. Yeah. And, and a large component of that are poppy seeds and sesame seeds. And I just couldn't live with doing that, especially when I saw the numbers, the amount of mm -hmm. oxalates that are in there. So uh, we, we switched some things around and took them out. And we, we came up with something that I, that I absolutely love. Where we, you know, pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds are incredibly low in oxalates. As far as seeds and nuts are concerned, they're they're, they're two of the oh, lowest. Oh, good to know. Yeah, good to know. Yeah. So there's an so that's a good right replacement. There. And nigella seeds are not only low in oxalates, but there are some doctors using that to treat patients that have issues like kidney stones and other oxalate related things. So that nigella adds a nice little black in there that you would have gotten from the poppy seed. So visually it's appealing, but I just love that smell and flavor from it. Anyhow. What is nigella um, seed? I'm not familiar with it. Black cumin. Okay. You ever seen, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're great. If you've ever had that, um, uh, what's Armenian string cheese. If you ever had that, it's kind of like this no. ropey, like pull apart cheese or filled with them. They're, they're worth a try. They're, um, I think you'd really like them. They add a lot of flavor and, and, and color to, to foods. So we did that, and that, that that's certainly helpful. But the reason I bring, I really am stuck on the sesame seed thing um, is because, I mean, that's tahini, right? So tahini is off the charts uh, with, with oxalates. It's just and been around so long. That's why I'm like, I know. how? how? So know, – but. <sighs> I feel I feel the same way you do. And listen, I, and I've experienced all the things I told you and even a few other issues we didn't have time for that have all been um, uh, dealt with or mitigated when I when I came off of oxalates. And sure, some of that, it, it might have been 
you know, just it happened at the same time. And some of it, I'm sure, uh, are are related. But I still wake up sometimes and I'm like, really, can it be that bad? You know, can can Almond Joy be that bad? Because I really like him and that sort of thing. But here's, I do believe that we should be living these incredible lives and killing over dead. Like incredible life, kill over dead, like wild animals do. And we don't. We die the last third of our life. We do this slow, long death, you know, low, slow, long death. And we're, we, we, we're, we've normalized joint pain. We've normalized our knees creaking, going up the stairs when we're 50 years old. We've normalized all these things because it's normal. It's normal in our species today with the way that we deal with our food and our, and our, and our bodies. Most of us have these issues. So it, it makes sense that we've normalized them. But we have to denormalize them because they're not – it's not right. We should be living these incredible, vibrant lives and then killing over dead. And I am confident that one of the many things that it could be, one of the large factors that results in us feeling a certain way when we're 40 and are 50 and, 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 and this joint pain and inflammation, oh, I'm confident that it's from a lifetime of eating massive quantities of oxalates. And all those things, the way that my knees felt walking up the steps five years ago, um, the ways my, you know, I'd feel when I was jogging in my joints, that sort of thing, all of it is gone. It is gone. Yeah. And I know it sounds crazy, but it is. I believe it, man. I mean, I was just starting to, so, you know, I've been into this stuff a long time. I've been on a lot of restriction diets. So I'm a little allergic to the idea of like cutting foods out. I'm way more interested in adding foods in, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, oh, this thing again. But but my knees, man, they, and, and I'd never, I mean, I've always been the person who can jump off something 10 feet high and just land. My knees never hurt. I love box jumps. I love climbing things. I've always, you know, I've been wearing like low profile barefooty shoes and Vibrams forever. And I just never had knee pain. And, um, I started to develop it and I, and it's in, it's, there's a correlation to this smoothie that I was doing with a lot of cacao and chia and, um, and sometimes a lot of nut butter in there too. So anyway, I started developing this knee pain and I just, it's so easy to go, well, I'm getting older, you know, and I started doing all the knees over toes stuff and the backwards walking and pulling sleds and that only helped a bit. But I was like, I still had this like kind of sharp pain in my knees and I didn't feel that there was a structural thing wrong with me. Anyway, once she said this, I was like, could it be? And I just changed my smoothie around and dude, my knees feel great now. I mean, it's only been like a couple of weeks. So I'm like, I'm like, okay, you know, if I wasn't for positive experience, I would dis- dismiss this. But it's that's hence I'm talking to you about it today. And and um, I something she said to me that really stood out is it would be great if we had food labeling. And you know, I don't see that as being that realistic. It's not like, well, I don't know. We we now have gluten free as a common, you know, call out on mm-hmm. foods. Um, and that came out of people. And that was another one where it's like, really though, gluten really? And then I think eventually I had to come around and be like, okay, you know, I get some response to gluten, but I see other people who get real strong responses. Yeah. So foods are labeled now. Um, it'd be so cool if we could get to a point where I could at least get a sense of how much was in a food package. That'd be really nice, you know, maybe, maybe that's a long ways off, but um, I think the conversation is important. So please, Bill, if you come across new data, please throw it over our desk too, because we'll just be so, sure. so curious about anything we can we can get on this thing. Yeah, let, let me just say one other thing about uh, our body sensing these oxalates. And this, again, I, I do realize that um, I'm sort of on this podium or jumping on this bandwagon a little bit because I've had such or at least felt like I've had such amazing success when I've taken them out of my diets. And I, and, and I want to spread the word as much as we can. Um, but one, one thing that I have noticed is that um, I would get sometimes uh, a feeling like in the upper part of the back of my throat um, every now and then noticeable that I, w- I would feel it sometimes when I ate things, um, nothing, major, but I would just, just a little bit of a, of a sense, a little bit of a reaction. Um, I haven't had that in years. And I was, I was giving a foraging tour, uh, a couple months ago and we were, one of the things, uh, we were, we had was a uh, wood sorrel and we were eating wood sorrel, which is oxalis. Uh, uh, yeah. Of literally the genus oxalis. Yeah. <laughs> literally the genus. It's and sour like it. lemons. Yeah. Oxalic <laughs> acid. <laughs> I actually felt that same feeling again, and right. I've been paying attention to it. And I, 
the, it, it may be something. I mean, the, now that you're saying, in other words, we might have a primal sensory system for this. We might. I mean, I only mention it because I, I know you're in tune with your senses. You're in tune with wild plants and domesticated plants and, and how your body reacts to these things. Pay attention to it. It might, it might be nothing there. But well, it might be I, something I there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's one be. way. You know, the other thing is, uh, you know, whenever I eat a high oxalic acid food, uh, I can feel it in my teeth. Yeah, you know, I'm sure, I mean, too. anybody who's eating spinach knows what I'm talking about. You're like, well, that's why sandy, my teeth pretty feel sort so, of feeling. Yeah. yeah, it's like, what's going on with my teeth right now? Um, yeah. yeah, that's really that's really fascinating. So, yeah, maybe this is something we we had more of a our senses are so blunted today. So, you know, perhaps that's. A piece of it too. You know, it's funny when we sat down today, I was thinking we would talk about this for a few minutes. Um, I didn't think that this would kind of consume our conversation, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of glad it did. And, and I, cause I want to keep, uh, I don't want to lose this thread. I think it's important. And I also don't want to get too obsessed with it. So I'm trying to walk that line, you know, but, uh, it's been neat to, cause I, you know, when I put out Sally's podcast, it's a little like controversial for my audience, you know, cause some, some people like don't want to hear it. Some people are really want to hear it. Uh, some people are on the fence about it. So I think continuing the conversation is really important. Um, and I'm hoping you'd be willing to come back because um, I would really like to have a conversation with you about the potato processing thing. You know, I was reading a post of yours. I've also I've spent some time in Peru sort of where, you know, the the, the diversity of potatoes is really high. And, um, you know, yeah. obviously there, there are toxins there and the way we eat our potatoes today, which are one of the, those kind of cornerstones of an American diet, uh, or much of the world's diet, uh, might, you know, the way we're doing it might not, might not be the most intelligent way. So maybe we could have you back at some point and we could kind of continue this conversation because there's a lot of foods that we're eating that can be great foods if we eat them correctly or bad foods if we eat them incorrectly, right? Because the pro it's a, in many cases, it's more about the process than the food itself, right? Yeah. And I think the potato is such a good poster child for that. I would love to come back and talk about potatoes. We could have a, a really in-depth, great conversation about that. Oh, that, that would be awesome, man. And, and thanks for sharing your personal story about it. And I, and as you mentioned, besides, well, yeah, besides the, the everything, you are selling something. You got the oh, spikes, so right? Is that, what this has been about? Is, is that what this has been about? You're making up corny <laughs> stories to push your bagels. Uh, you no, I, I really appreciate you sharing your personal accounts because I think too, like, um, you know, when you're when you're in, when you're doing influencer work online, especially in the health space, you're incentivized to not have health issues you know, to not mm -hmm. talk about anything. And that's one of the things that I saw when I was in the vegan world, in the raw food vegan world, I saw a lot of people lying about their health because it was in their financial best interest to pretend that their diets were, were creating like perfect health experiences. And so, as you mentioned before, you know, what worked for them initially stopped working, but then they wouldn't want to say anything because now they're, they're deep in it and they're making money sure. from it. And that's their whole, and then I think even more than the money incentive is like my whole identity's wound into this thing. Uh, so I appreciate you sharing your personal stories and your journey on this. Um, cause I think it's compelling. Um, yeah. And then if uh, I just want to open up the space, man, for anything you want to share about, uh, talk about promote. Um, I know you got uh, a lot going on. It sounds like with the restaurant down there and everything. So yeah, feel free to, uh, plug people in anywhere you want. Awesome. Thank you. So like I mentioned earlier, um, my family and I have the Modern Stone Age Kitchen here in Chestertown, Maryland, and we are, uh, if anybody's seen my book, Eat Like a Human, we are literally putting that book into practice uh, to so nourish cool. the community. And uh, so we, everything we make is entirely uh, in-house, no two ingredients put together by anyone else and outside of these walls. And we, uh, we do nose to tail butchering and and cooking, uh, fermenting all of our dairy. We make all of our butter and house or cheese, all of it. Um, and we have the really cool thing is it's not strange, weird, off the charts food. It's really incredible, familiar food um, that is made in the most safest and most nourishing way possible. So things like pizzas and tacos, you know, we're using all these ancestral and traditional approaches to make these foods. So um, if you're anywhere as near our area, we'd love to see you. Um, if not, check us out online anyhow at modernstoneagekitchen.com. And we do, we're now starting to ship a lot of our, a lot of our foods. And then our nonprofit, the Eastern Shore Food Lab uh, is up and running. We have a, an amazing teaching kitchen upstairs where we show and we have a completely open source kitchen <laughs> if anybody wants any recipe any technique i'll be happy to share it with you and come in and see us and we'd love to show you how to do these things so you can check that out at uh eatlikeahuman.com 
and get those great t-shirts and your book is awesome too, man. I'm going to say, um, so thank you very much. Worth a read. Thank you. I wanted to tell you just, uh, sort of lastly, I was just, uh, in Hawaii. So I got to spend a bunch of time on Molokai and, uh, was hunting there, foraging there. And, uh, the folks have, you know, many traditions that have been ongoing for, you know, all the way back, um, since they got to the Hawaiian islands. So there's like these, you know, still intact foraging traditions, uh, and collecting traditions. So we, you know, we were out on the coast and we were picking, uh, these beautiful purple urchins, breaking their backs open, eating the uni mm. or, or taking limpets and so each eating them raw right out of the shell, you know, and this is totally normal for everybody. We came upon a noni tree and I found some really nice ripe noni on the ground. So I cracked these things open and I'm eating them and these guys cannot believe it. They cannot believe that I would do this. And I mean, they're eating all, they, they watched me eat the, the fat from behind the eyes of Axis deer raw, you know, like just cleaning off skulls and just eating <laughs> that fat from behind the eye. Don't flinch right. at that. I eat this noni fruit for the whole time I'm there. Dudes are just like telling everybody they meet, this guy ate the noni. This guy ate the noni fruit, <laughs> you know, and my friend Monsel had been out there and they had killed a doe, a pregnant doe. And uh, he had he and his friends had all drank the amniotic fluid. And they thought that was really strange, but they were like, but that's not the weird. craziest thing. The craziest thing, this guy ate the noni. <laughs> I just thought that's that was so funny. Just interesting, like perspectives on what's weird to do. I think of it because, you know, in your book, you sort of open with a blood and milk drinking scene. So <laughs> I just thought that was funny because. Oh. You know, what people think is weird and what people think is uh, is normal, you know. That's awesome. That's a great story. <laughs> Bill, I'm really looking forward to uh, the next time uh, we get to talk and uh, hopefully I get to connect with you in person soon. Thanks so much for your time today, man. Me as well. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.